Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 26 year in business. It's Monday, March 23rd, 2015, and today's very special audio blog is titled Gold, Silver, and Miles Franklin. Now, today, I'm going to throw a bit of a change of pace pitch in, for the most part, avoiding the day's front page topics, like, for instance, this weekend's comments from the Saudi and Kuwaiti oil ministers that they won't cut production alone. Today's supposed make-or-break talks between Angela Merkel and Alexis Serpris, this morning's second straight unexpected recessionary reading from the Chicago Fed National Activity Index and weak existing home sales number, or heck, the Bank of International Settlements' ominous weekend warning to central bankers that, quote, the priority should be to address the nexus of debt and poor asset quality head-on rather than relying on overly aggressive and prolonged macroeconomic accommodation. Heck, I'm not even going to discuss last night's 91st Sunday night sentiment precious metals capping of the past 92 weekends or 403rd cap and attack of the past 462 2.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time opens of the London pre-market trading session. No, today I'm going to give a little history of myself, Miles Franklin, and the reasons we own physical gold and silver. Starting with that fateful day in May 2002, when I received a hot tip from my company-appointed stockbroker at Solomon Smith Barney to buy Newmont Mining at roughly $30 a share. In his view, as I recalled, the dollar index had just peaked at roughly 120 and was set to continue declining from its then level of roughly 117. At that point, my entire life was consumed by oil, as it is a as it is gold and silver now, as I had been an oil field service analyst at Solomon Smith Barney and before that South Coast Capital in New Orleans and a small New York City hedge fund since 1996. And by the way, when working at Solomon, I was required to make all trades through Solomon's trading desk, so a measly hundred shares of Newmont likely cost at least 50 bucks, let alone several thousand shares of a thinly traded junior miner, which could cost, even after employee discount, commissions of around $1,000. I was still 31 years old, and this was the first time I had been made aware of the fundamentals of the dollar and precious metals. And as for the Fed, they were still a bit of a mystery to me, as despite then the then two-year-old tech wreck, Maestro Greenspan was still one of the most respected bankers in the world, even if he never followed up his infamous December 1996 irrational exuberance speech with actual action to slow it down. My broker, named Doug Cundy, by the way, still a friend 13 years later, was new to this sector too, so his initial thoughts were as crude as my then understanding. However, given my intensely persistent, curious, and profit-seeking nature, I quickly delved deep into the precious metal world, and literally, within weeks, was fully invested in mining stocks, and likely closed-end bullion funds like the Central Fund of Canada as well. At that point, my investment focus was purely offensive, in that I simply viewed gold and silver as highly undervalued assets, with PM miners providing an effective means to leverage gold and silver's movements, and perhaps one day become the next internet stock, um, stock sector. Even before that point, when by the way, gold and silver prices were $290 per ounce and $475 per ounce respectively, I was no stranger to economic bearishness, having sold my last stock Caprock Communications, I believe it was, in April 2000, and been 100% in cash since. However, even in my wildest nightmares, I could not conceive of a world in, of complete economic and monetary disarray just six years later, and 13 years later where we stand today on the verge of irreversible catastrophic failure. I mean, heck, the U.S. national debt was just $6 trillion in 2002, compared to $18 trillion today, plus $5 plus trillion off balance sheet for the nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac money pits and perhaps 200 plus trillion of unfunded liabilities. And as for the US economy, well, it, is just, it had just peaked two years earlier. So whether the dollar index was set to rise or fall, and remember, the primary component of the dollar index is the euro, which had just started trading three years prior. It was difficult to conceive in 2002 of such a dramatic economic reversal even being possible. I mean, back then, Abby Joseph Cohen, the then well-respected but in hindsight dead wrong chief strategist at Goldman Sachs, compared the U.S. economy to a supertanker with so much momentum it would be extremely difficult to turn around. 
Well, turn around it did, and then some. And by the time 2008 crisis hit, I was well aware that fiat monetary regimes were nothing but Ponzi schemes perpetuated by bankers and politicians for their own personal interests, and thus mathematically certain to fail as the first 600 before it happened. Immediately upon my foray into gold and silver mining stocks, I was introduced to the writings of Richard Russell, Jim Sinclair, and Bill Murphy and Chris Powell of Gata. Each evening, I printed out upwards of 50 pages of material at work of not only their writings, but anyone else of note on such topics, and intensely read them on both the New York City subway and Long Island Railroad on my roughly 80-minute commute home, which, by the way, was considered a good commute compared to the two-plus-hour miseries many out-of-towners experience. By the time I left Solomon and Wall Street in February 2005, ten years ago I might add, I was so thoroughly consumed with precious metals that I had little, if any, remaining interest in oil and gas. Who could have known the, the career and philosophical path I would have subsequently taken? Around that time, circa 2005, I had become so knowledgeable of precious metals, Bill Murphy started to publish my nearly daily freelance work on the, on the Gata site. Miles Franklin's Bill Holter had already been doing so for some years before that, and between us and perhaps two or three others, formed a cornerstone of Gata contributors that prompted none other than Eric Sprott himself at Gata's fantastic 2011 London conference to personally thank us for our contributions. As you can imagine, my deep connection to Bill Murphy, Chris Powell, and Gata, combined with my longtime trading observations and intense research passion, caused me to become an authority on gold and silver manipulation. And today, there's not a doubt in my mind that but a handful of people in the world have as thorough an understanding of both how and why such manipulations are perpetrated, on financial markets generally, and precious metals specifically. Regarding gold and silver, the roughly 600 pages of manipulation primers I wrote in 2011-12, to 12, which I'd be happy to send you, serve as gold standards for understanding the cartel's playbook. And despite the fact that high-frequency algorithms have since taken over as the primary, primary weapon of mass financial destruction, said playbook is still roughly the same, albeit far more relentless and intense. Which, of course, is the case because, as said Ponzi scheme careens more rapidly toward its inevitable collapse, the powers that be have been forced to fight economic mother nature at an exponentially more intense pace. In 2006, after the two best years of my investment career, solely due to mining stocks, I was afforded the opportunity to work in the mining industry in various roles ranging from corporate development to investor relations to investor relations consulting. After two years of unsuccessfully trying to convince mainstream Wall Street firms that they needed a precious metal mining analyst, this seemed a perfect way to capitalize on my Wall Street experience, expand my knowledge of the mining shares that accounted for the majority of my net worth, and spread the word of how undervalued the sector was. Unfortunately, the junior miners, as measured by the Vancouver Stock Exchange, i.e. The, now the TSX Venture, it peaked in April 2007, when unquestionably, naked shorting became more the rule than the exception. And not only U.S. government-led attempts to quash exploding precious metal sentiment, but Canadian investment banks attempting to destroy clients' bargaining positions by forcing them into terrible financings, where the lower the stock price, the more dilutive warrants had to be issued. When the 2008 crisis came around, the vast majority of my 2002-2007 to mining share gains were lost. And if it, I hadn't coincidentally sold some at the top to fund my home purchase in May 2007, no doubt all would have been lost, and I wouldn't be here writing today. Frankly, my net worth was down close to 70% by the bottom of the late 2008 cartel raids, which could have been avoided entirely if I had held physical metal instead of mining stocks. And if it weren't for the pure luck that the one stock I tripled down on, Silverstone Resources, subsequently was acquired by Silver Wheaton and surged, I again wouldn't be here writing today. But still, my net worth remains 50% below that of its spring 2007 peak, and this despite gold and silver prices having risen from roughly $675 per ounce and $13 per ounce respectively since that time. Yes, the cartel has all but destroyed the mining sector, likely permanently, as given the incredible collapse of capital spending, resulting in essentially zero major discoveries for more than a decade, as well as an exodus of personnel in an industry characterized by exponentially increased geologic, engineering, environmental, social, capital raising, and government risks, makes it extremely unlikely that production will ever materially increase, 
let alone when the inevitable reemergence of gold and silver as true monetary metals prompts governments to expropriate, nationalize, and windfall tax essentially every major precious metal mine and mining development, and likely capital gains on mining stocks. As noted above, I learned this the hard way in 2008, which is why I started divesting my mining stocks and closed-end fund holdings during the 2008 crisis, culminating with my final mining share sale in the spring of 2011, when I went all in on physical gold and silver. And by the way, not only did I cash out my remaining paper assets, but in 2009, at the age of 39, cashed out my IRA as well, knowing full well that the congressional discussions regarding IRA confiscation in 2008 would have gone from the discussion stage to law if the Fed's post-crisis reflation attempts had failed, which today is more of a risk than ever, as said crisis is far worse today, as well as the U.S. government's dire financial condition. And if you don't think that the new MIRA program that was just uh, initiated by the government is not the precursor of an uh, eventual confiscation, uh, you have, <laughs> you're very naive. <laughs> Anyhow, in mid-2011, just as I had coincidentally sold my last mining stock, whilst remaining stuck in the mining investor relations business, I received a call from David Sheckman, an avid Gatter reader who was by then well aware of my writings. David had started Miles Franklin back in 1989, well before the precious metal mark bull market had commenced, becoming one of the leading Swiss annuity distributors here in the States, which we still are. Miles Franklin transitioned into principally precious metal bullion dealership at the turn of the century, although David had been writing of the coming gold and silver bull well before the rest of the world cared. In fact, the Miles Franklin report actually predates the precious metal bull, and today, in, in its current version, the Miles Franklin blog is likely one of the longest-running newsletters in the precious metal industry, not to mention it's free. Like myself on the Gata website, which I might add, both myself and Bill Holter also contributed for free all those years, David Sheckman wrote of why gold and silver should be utilized to protect one's assets against the inevitable hyperinflation of fiat currency regimes and ensure themselves against the myriad economic and political black swan events that continually arise, particularly in the late stages of history's largest, most global fiat Ponzi scheme. What's so amazing about the Miles Franklin blog, by the way, is that despite the essentially identical message, David, Bill, and myself have such incredibly differing but equally readable writing styles. Like Bill and myself on the GATA website, David had been writing of such things for many years, and frankly, put even Bill and I to shame in terms of industry experience, in that he cut his teeth in precious metals back in the early 1980s. Which, by the way, is where he met three of Miles Franklin's current brokers, who sold precious metals together before some of our clients were even born. Actually, that's four, not three of our brokers. In October 2011, I fulfilled my so-called destiny when I joined Miles Franklin as its marketing director, enabling me to not only focus my writings on the principal, principal asset in my personal portfolio, but a significantly broader platform to further my passion of educating the world of all I've learned in 25 years on Wall Street and as of today, 13 years in precious metals. A year later, Bill Holter joined Miles Franklin as well, and today, the Miles Franklin blog is both read and listened to by tens of thousands of people each day, from literally six continents. Perhaps someone's following us in Antarctica as well, and if you are, we'd love to hear from you. That said, I just want to reiterate the key tenets of why we own precious metals, particularly now as said exponential efforts to suppress gold and silver prices have yielded the lowest sector sentiment since I launched my precious metals life in 2002. That is, here in the States, as in the rest of the world, where gold prices are amidst strong bull market trends, demand is dramatically stronger. In fact, as noted in last December's End of the Gold Bear Market article, prices are at, near, or within shouting distance of all-time highs in the majority of global currencies, care of a surging dollar index due to a worldwide flight to liquidity amidst the wor a worse economic and, in most cases, monetary crisis than 2008 and 2000, and 2000 combined. Heck, even here in the States, first quarter U.S. Mint Silver Eagle sales are on a par with last year's record levels, depicting just how powerful and unsustainable the current dichotomy of prices well below the cost of production amidst surging physical demand has become. As I have exhaustively stated for years, gold and silver are decidedly not to be viewed as 
investments which typically have limited time horizons and an expectation of selling when prices rise too high. To the contrary, precious metals should be viewed not as investments, but the money they are, as opposed to dollars, euros, and yen, which from a definitional standpoint couldn't be further from money if they tried, as opposed to the limited use currencies they actually are. Well, actually, there is one other class of currency that's even further from the definition of money than dollars, euros, and yen, which sadly for those hoping for a new di digital revolution in money is Bitcoin. But that's another argument for another day. Over perhaps 5,000 years, only gold and silver have maintained their monetary value in not only preserving purchasing power, but increasing it relative to the literally thousands of competing, in most cases worthless, monetary assets concocted by bankers and governments, as opposed to the unique, universally admired intrinsic value bestowed upon gold, silver, and to a lesser extent platinum by Mother Nature herself. To wit, there's a reason why phrases like good as gold, silver lining, and gold standard have become such unwavering ubiquitous constants, constants of the human existence, referred to in wonder by economic texts, arts and literature, and the Bible itself for time immemorial, as opposed to dollars, euros, and yen, which aren't even considered. Or for that matter, why even the most financially unsavvy are just as cognizant of the signals rising gold and silver prices emit as those of the stock market itself. Which, of course, is why the powers that be have waged war on rising precious metal and falling stock prices in recent years, given just how desperate such markets are to portray a far different signal than the alternate reality the power that be soon to be completely invalidated propaganda scheme purports. Throw in the fact that 15 years of relentless price suppression of both metals and mining stocks have so strangled the capital formation and investment process that, as noted above, the mining industry has been all but destroyed for years to come. In other words, as the terminal phase of history's largest fiat Ponzi scheme yields exponentially larger money printing, economic deterioration, and currency debasement, the resultant physical gold and silver demand explosion will coincide with the stagnant at best and more likely dramatically declining production. In other words, as I wrote in That Other Reason to Own Precious Metals, not only are gold and silver prices likely to soar based on pure monetary factors, but simple economics 101 type supply factors. And last but not least, we have the potential for said black swan events to yield instantaneous explosions in both price and demand, which frankly, in most cases, would be difficult to characterize as such, given just how high their likelihoods have become. Such as, for instance, the Greek Euro Grexit that appears all but guaranteed, or the horrifying political, economic, and social ramifications of continued commodity price weakness, or the potential breakout of war in the Middle East or Ukraine, or bank runs and or capital controls in any number of nations where collapsing economies and currencies are fomenting social unrest, secession movements, and political revolutions. To that end, I urge you to consider at least some asset protection in the form of physical metals ownership, and in turn to consider Miles Franklin if your personal due diligence process leads to this conclusion. Again, I cannot emphasize enough that with the exception of Miles, Franklin, Miles Franklin's home state of Minnesota, precious metals is an entirely unregulated business, and thus various scams and, far more prevalent, unethical business practices have been foisted upon unsuspecting customers over the years which makes it so important, now more than ever, to work with reputable companies like Miles Franklin, which as it turns out is every bit as competitive on price as its competitors, while Wilt's proudly claiming the industry's best customer service. And aside from being one of the few dealers subject to the strict operational regulations of the state of Minnesota, has an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating and not a single registered customer complaint since opening its doors in 1989. And oh yeah, we published the Miles Franklin blog for free each day, providing not only the highest quality commenta commentary in the sector, but likely the deepest and broadest quantity as well. Not to mention what we believe to be the finest precious metal storage program in the industry at Brink Security in Montreal, where all the firm's principals, myself included, store their personal metal. And at the helm remains David Sheckman, who starred the firm in 1989, and his son Andy, who joined a year later. Together, their knowledge of the business and integrity in carrying it out is unparalleled, which is why our reputation is so strong and why each and every customer is treated, at least from a business standpoint, like family. And thus, if you decide to take action by buying or storing precious metals, we hope you'll call Miles Franklin at 800-822-8080 and give us a chance to earn your business.
And as always, I can be reached via email at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks very much.